Hey guys, welcome back to another video. Today we're gonna to be talking about the five questions that you should be asking your commercial banking interviewer when you're interviewing for a job. And so this video is actually very relevant for not only people that are entering the sector, coming out of school or in internships, but as well for mid-career commercial bankers that are thinking about switching jobs. And the purpose is to really figure out, is that job right for me? And also how do I stand out and really show that I'm focused and interested in this role? So whether you're a student or someone entering the sector, you know, choosing the right job and team is very important to your career success and also your overall happiness. And commercial banking is a very client-facing sales and deal-focused career path. So asking the right questions in your interview will not only communicate your desire for that job, but it will also show off how prepared you are and determine if it's the right fit because certain cultures or certain sales environments may not be that right fit for you. And ultimately, this is a sales job. And th there are a lot of articles out there and videos that talk about the general questions that you should ask an interviewer, you know, kind of about your compensation, the team, the culture, you know, professional development opportunities within that company. But the purpose of this video is really what commercial banking specific interviewer questions should I be asking? And so you know, if I'm in your shoes and I'm thinking about switching banks or, you know, going back into commercial banking, you know, the way I think about it is there's probably five really key important areas that I need to figure out for this specific role. And they are understanding what you're lending or what am I really selling. Number two, understanding how the bank is positioned in the marketplace, i.e. how competitive is the bank? Are they very competitive or are they lagging the market? You're never going to win a term sheet. You know, also measuring sales success. How much do I have to sell? Understanding your sales book. Am I harvesting or am I hunting for new deals or am I harvesting the existing bank's client? And then lastly, understanding your sales team and the environment that you're in. So if you can kind of figure out these five key concepts, you're going to have a pretty good understanding of how that job is a fit for you or not. So let's jump into the first question. So what am I selling? And the question that I would be asking is, can you talk about your team's deal flow and lending solutions or products? More specifically, where are you finding the deal flow today? And what types of loans do you see most frequently that you're winning in the marketplace in terms of term sheets? And so the point of this question is to figure out that each commercial banking team has their own set of clients and mix of types of businesses and industries that they focus on. So every commercial banking interview that you're going to go into, if there are different jobs, you know, they're going to have different kind of market focuses, different types of products that they're placing into the marketplace, even though they may be all selling the same broad range of lending solutions. You know, there's this natural tendency to go back to the same sectors that they've already funded into. Their networks are geared toward those sectors. So you need to kind of figure out right away, you know, for this specific lending opportunity, you know, what are you lending to? And what are kind of your common sectors? Are you doing a lot of real estate loans? Are you focused primarily on manufacturing type opportunities? Are you backing a lot of investment properties, IPL type opportunities? What is that? And getting a good sense of that mix of, of business. Because you'll see that most offices have very kind of core top three markets that they focus on. And then ultimately, you want to understand, A, is that something that I'm interested in as being the, you know, interviewing for this role? Am I interested in primarily focusing on the real estate sector, seeing that the team is doing a lot of real estate lending when maybe I'm a cash flow lender? And secondly, you can even position it as, you know, if they're focused on that sector and you're not, maybe the mandate is to grow beyond those sectors and you're bringing a different set of skills or a different book of business or a different network to that opportunity. So you can take it in both ways. You can look at it and say, is that a fit for me? Or secondly, if it's not and, you know, it's, I have a very different background or network of COIs that I can bring to this team, is that a value add for your team. And you can even ask that follow-up question and say, hey, listen, you know what, you know, okay, great, to, good to know that, you know, you're primarily focused on the real estate side or equipment lending opportunities. You know, on my current job, I'm primarily focused on M&A financing. You know, are you guys interested in the cash flow lending space? Is that something that you want to take the bank into? And you'll figure out very quickly whether that's a yes or a no and whether that's a fit for you. So really getting a good sense of that sector ex exposure is critical to standing out and also just figuring out if it is a good fit for you. Now, the second question is, how competitive is your bank? And the way I'd phrase this is, what area of the lending market do you find that your bank, you know, Scotiabank, RBC, Bank of America, is most competitive in relative to other lenders? What types of loans or transactions do you feel you're not competitive in and why is that? 
And so this is a really good open-ended question because it's really important to understand that, you know, that bank that you're interviewing for, where do they fit in the competitive landscape? You know, are they considered a very pricing aggressive type bank because they have low cost of capital and they're looking to price loans very cheaply? Or are they more a little bit more structurally creative where, you know, they can do longer amortizations or provide more leverage than traditional banks? Maybe they're a tier two provider or maybe they're sector specific. You know, we're very, we're transport focused lenders and we'll be very aggressive in transport but we're not that competitive in other sectors. So being able to understand where that bank fits in the marketplace is, again, really important for you to understand. Is that a good fit with with what I'm doing? And then at the same time, you want to figure out if you're joining a competitive bank or not because the downside is, say, for example, you're joining a bank that has very expensive costs of capital and they're not structurally creative. So it's a lose-lose. Ultimately, they're expensive money, and also, they're you know kind of very structured in the way they have a very weak risk team, and so they're not winning a lot of deals. And so you know, hopefully, the manager is telling you that and saying, yeah, you know, we're not we're not finding a lot of traction in the current marketplace. Then you can either decide that's a good thing because you know, hey, I can come in and add some value, and maybe lift the team up, or I want to avoid that because if I'm selling an uncompetitive product, I'm not going to meet my sales targets, and this is going to become a tougher job for me to perform in. So. It's really important to understand the competitiveness of the bank that you're working for. And when I think about, you know, why banks are uncompetitive, I always kind of group them into a few buckets. You know, the first one, the biggest thing that always stands out to me, you know, number one over here is it's a weak risk department. You know, inexperienced risk managers, a lot of turnover or, you know, risk managers that are more focused on protecting themselves for retirement rather than taking transaction risks and pushing, you know, the the envelope forward in terms of the types of deals that the bank is able to do, you know, that limits you as a relationship manager on the sales side because really you coexist with a risk manager. You go find the deal as a relationship manager or the credit analyst that you're working with the relationship manager, but then there's a risk manager that signs off on those deals. And if that risk manager is weak or is very apprehensive to the current marketplace, it doesn't matter how much you push. It doesn't matter how many people you talk to. If you can't get those deals through risk, then that's not a place that you should be in the commercial banking space. Now, the other limiter may be top-down decisions. You know, and, and again, these are things that you can kind of di- dig into as you're talking to that per- that uh, hiring manager. You know, what do you feel about management? Like, do you feel that they're pretty supportive of the sales team? You know, are they really encouraging your deal flow, or do you find that you know they're stuck in their ways? Another is naturally some banks are more cost. Comp- you know, the cost of capital is a lot higher. So if they're a tier two lender, they're a private lender, they're a boutique lending firm, and they don't have access to cheap cost of capital, naturally their lending rates are going to be higher, which limits you from being able to do a broad range of deals. You have to be more focused in the types of businesses that want to borrow at that cost of capital. And then lastly, maybe the bank has a poor historical lending record, record and they've gone through a bunch of loan losses. You know, Maybe one of their divisions was in the news, you know, Say, for example, HSBC in the early 2000s, they had a few kind of, you know, missteps. And so when that happens, the bank naturally pulls back to kind of lick their wounds, really reset the strategy of the bank and clean up their credit losses to demonstrate to shareholders that they're good. But that from a lending perspective, from a day to day, you know, I'm the person pushing the product out. That's limiting because now you can't be as aggressive because the bank is stepping back. So these are kind of the things that I would be thinking about because ultimately the team that you join is going to influence a big part of your personal budget sales target success. Because if you can't sell the product, the product's uncompetitive, then it's probably not the right place for you to be. And so the way I think about, you know, just the marketplace a little bit further is that, you know, I kind of almost put it on a scale. You know, the axis over here is risk appetite, you know, the increasing risk appetite. And then naturally, there's a corresponding increase in the cost of money. So as risk increases, the cost of money increases. And so naturally, the banks, the big banks are going to be, you know, a little bit more conservative, but they're also going to be the cheapest cost of capital. So they're in the bottom quadrant over here. Credit unions are kind of like banks, but they're a little bit more expensive because their cost of capital is higher. And then the appetite, maybe the cost of capital is similar to the banks, but you have specialized lenders that are comfortable in lending to specific sectors and accepting more risk, but pricing it very similar to the banks. And then lastly, you have the private lenders here, where they're looking for higher risk deals in order to find those higher yields for their investors. So 
where do you find yourself in the marketplace and the job that you're interviewing for, where does it land on this? And then again, it's a personal discussion with yourself. Am I comfortable pivoting if I'm at the banks today and, and, and being recruited or applying to a private lending role? Is my network, is, is, is who I am as a person, am I able to shift and focus on a different area of the marketplace? Or maybe I'm a private lender today and I'm looking to join a big bank. You know, is, is, am I really set up for that? So these are kind of the questions that I would be thinking about. Now, question number three is how much do I have to sell? It's a very simple question. It's a sales role. So it's all about targets and figuring out what are my targets and what, you know, how, how do I get measure my success in my role? And so this question I kind of split into two. Because if you're an entry level person, then the first segment here is more relevant. But if you're mid level and you're already coming into the industry, you're there, and you know you're going to be expected to bring in business right away, then the the second aspect of this question is relevant. So the way I would position this is: What are my sales and financial targets as a relationship manager, as a credit analyst? You put in your position here, and furthermore, if I'm an entry level, am I expected to bring in new loans or originate credit opportunities in my first year? So if you're an entry level, what are my sales and financial targets as a credit analyst? And am I expected to bring in new loans or originate credit opportunities my first year? Okay, so that allows you to figure out, you know, because if I'm coming out of school and I don't really have a good business network, am I expected to bring in business right away? Or do I have time to get a feel for the, for the industry to start making those relationships to eventually start bringing in opportunities? So you want to figure that out right away because... Again, if you don't have experience and you're not confident in yourself that you're able to create those, those relationships quickly, then it may not be the opportunity for you. So for example, for me, when I entered the commercial banking industry, I was hired into a role two months. The first two months, I spent mostly in kind of a quasi-analyst role, building uh, you know, models, understanding the credit underrated process. But I quickly hit the market, built relationships. And by month nine, I was able to bring in my first deal and start originating those opportunities. So even though it was an entry-level role, I was kind of expected to bring in new business versus another op- roles that may not be the case. Now, if you're in the mid-level or you're already in that industry, you know, what are my financial targets as a senior relationship manager? And what kind of runway do I have to hit my budget timing-wise? And what is your expectation of me sales-wise in terms of my first year? And the reason why you would ask this is if you're already switching jobs into somewhere else, you're expected to bring in business right away like they're not going to sit and wait on you to bring in business in two three years time you know they paying you a high salary and you will have sales budgets so it's important to figure out a if you're if in your current role in a mid-level role you're a relationship manager at Scotiabank and you have a 30 million dollar target of business and now you're joining RBC and now your target's 100 million dollars is that big jump really capable can you do that or is that too big of a jump so you need to figure out what your budgets are firstly and then secondly you want to understand okay what kind of runway do I have you know am I expected to meet budget in my first year because sometimes what ends up happening is you know yes your target is 40 million dollars but you know in your first year you know if you fill only 20 million dollars it's still okay because you know the, you're building your network you're switching over there's that natural time lag that comes with switching banks and now repositioning your network to a new bank or a new product so banking hiring managers understand that that's not the challenge the challenge is when am i really expected to meet budget what kind of runway do i have and that's a polite way to say that but ultimately you want to figure out you know no you have a 40 million dollar budget you know we're no nonsense here we expect you to fill that budget year one get to work day one kind of thing and then you got to figure out, is that, am I capable of doing that? And is that the kind of environment that I want to be in? Or do I want something a little bit more relaxed where I have more runway to work with? Because that is, again, a very key influence on your overall compensation, but also your happiness. Because I remember when I joined, I knew I kind of had runway. So even though I wasn't getting traction, I was just coming out of school. So it was different for me. But you know, I wasn't really getting that traction. Whereas, you know, if, if, if I was a mid-career and I switched banks and I wasn't finding deals, I'd be pretty stressed out. You know, I would kind of struggle to find, okay, where am I going to go? You know, where can I find that first deal and get that first kill? Because, you know, it's a confidence thing. And then if all of a sudden you're not bringing in deals in the month nine, you know, your confidence starts going down. People start looking at you and thinking, oh, why do we hire this guy? And, you know, you kind of, it gets in your head. 
So again, it's really important to figure that out. And then sometimes what ends up happening is for, is for so certain teams where they have two really strong sales leaders or a, or a rainmaker, you know, they may distribute deals, right? You may join a team and it may be worthwhile to even ask, you know, hey, for the junior reps or for people that are not meeting budget, do you share deals? You know, can we kind of co-partner on certain deals where I get credit, a portion of the credit as well applied to my budget target and, and figure out if, you know, if that's the helping mood of the team. Other teams, it's sink or swim and we're all alone. But, you know, on certain teams, certain commercial banking teams, the manager is like, no, 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 you've already filled your budget. Let's bring in Ryan here. Or let's bring in John over here and fill their budget because, you know, they're behind. And that's kind of the team that you want to be on because obviously then your budgets are a little bit easier to hit and you get more bonuses. Now, question number four is harvesting versus hunting. And this really relates to the loan book, you know, the book of business that you have. And that's really the clients, the active ongoing credit opportunities of the bank. So you've placed a loan and now that loan needs to be managed. You need to do quarterly reviews, annual reviews, you need to, you know, do a site visit annually to check with the client, talk to the client about their needs. So there's ongoing work after you place a loan. And now you're coming in as a new hire. The, you know, the key question is, will I be working with an existing loan book or will I have to build my own book of business? And then if they say, yeah, you will be working with a loan book, well, then how many companies in that book will I be managing? And so the reason why this is important is because it's a double-edged sword. You know, loan books are good in some ways, and then they're also added work in other ways, right? At the end of the day, a lot of your compensation, I would say anywhere from 50 to 70% of your bonus is geared towards new business with 30% more focus on the other things. So if all of a sudden you have a massive book of business, say, for example, you're switching roles, you had 30 clients over here, and now you have 200 clients in this book of business that you have to manage. Well, you know, that's a big step up in terms of all this extra work that you have to do. And all of a sudden, if your budget's higher, you're moving up market, you got to change your network and start calling new people. Well, that's a ton of things to manage in that first year. So it all kind of is interconnected. You know, you got you then have to consider that with your runway. If they expect you to meet your budget in your first year and they're giving you a larger book of business with a larger sales target, you know, is that too big of a hurdle to clear in that first year? And are you willing to accept lower compensation because you're not going to meet budget? So these are kind of the things that you need to be asking. So when it comes to the loan book, you know, for someone that's in the entry level role, it's really important to figure out if you will be working with a loan book. Because for you as an entry level analyst or relationship manager, a loan book is probably a positive thing. Because it allows you to deal with an existing group of clients that have to take your call because you're the bank. <laughs> you call them and you say, hey, John, how's your manufacturing business going? Would love to come out and see you. And you go out to see them. You start building a relationship. You start learning about business. You start learning about the day-to-day -day thinking of an entrepreneur. And then probably if you're, if you're brave enough and if you know sales, you can walk out of that meeting and say, hey, John, you know what? I'd really love to meet your accountant You know, and learn more about their clients. Maybe I can kind of help finance some of their other businesses as well. It's like, okay, beautiful. I'll connect you with my accountant. And then you get a warm lead into a center of influence that may give you other new business leads. So harvesting that book of business as an entry level commercial banker is probably a good thing. And it's going to give you new leads and it gives you kind of that initial boost of support to start building a network. But if you're an existing relationship manager, you know, sometimes mm, I would say for me personally, if I was coming into a new role, I wouldn't want a big book of business because, you know, A, I don't know those clients. I already have a good network of business. So I don't need to harvest that book as much as maybe entry level analyst. Now, it's important to know in this last point over here, if you don't have a book of business, you know, then probably the expectation for that role is for you to do a lot of sales. Because if they're not going to allocate a book of business, because someone's going to do it, right? Every loan office has existing clients. So who's doing that today? And if you're, you're being brought into that team and they're not expecting you to do that extra 30% work and your job is to find sales and build more business, then you probably have higher sales pressure and more expectations from you. So it's not always the best thing. If you're not the strongest on the sales front and they're saying, no, no, we're not giving you a book of business. We want you to focus on selling. Okay, you kind of know how much focus there is on building new opportunities and adding new clients to the book of business. So this is an interesting one, but that's why it's really important to ask this. Figure out that if they do have, if they're going to give you a loan of book, 
and then as well understand you know what that relates to you know your own personal objectives are you a harvester are you a hunter is that a good thing or a bad thing for you now the last question i'd ask is more about the sales environment so the question is can you talk to me about the existing sales team how would you describe the culture of the team and what are some of their strengths and weaknesses so i can understand where i fit on the team and where i can add value and so while a lot of your compensation is really tied to your individual sales performance targets, you know, delivering $20 million worth of loans or, you know, $125,000 worth of lending margin, you know, at the end of the day, having a good team really feeds into your success. A, because sometimes teams help each other, right? You know, so you, you may be behind on budget and someone brings in a deal and gives you that deal so that you can meet your budget. Or maybe you're going up together and you start tag teaming meetings, you're hosting marketing events together and going to prospect meetings together to show a united front and, you know, really good present, you know, a, a better presentation to those clients because there's multiple people attending the meeting. So, you know, if there's a collaborative environment where team members are working together, that's a great thing because ultimately it's added, it's an added bonus to you because it allows you to more quickly build relationships with clients. You can lean on people when maybe you're a little slower. And then at the same time, obviously, if you're doing very well, then you can help bring your team members up. And it's just a positive environment versus, you know, and this is why it's important to ask. There are other situations where it's a lot more independent. You know, there's four or five senior relationship managers. They're all 20 years in the business. They're so focused on their own bar budgets that they're not really going to spend time with you to comb market or go in and work on, on, you know, files together. And if that's the case, you need to ask yourself, am I independent enough to do that? Because if I was a junior going into the industry for the first time or with very little experience, I'd be very focused on finding an environment where there are good senior relationship managers that are willing to spend time with me to do those ride alongs in that first six to 12 months to take me so that we can work together on deals because being able to watch that senior banker talk to the client structure the deal pitch the term sheet win the term sheet those are all experiences that are really important for someone that's learning that and learning that alone versus learning that with someone else there's a big difference so you know understanding how the team supports and trains new analysts or new relationship managers is critical. And then as well, you know, say for example, you ask this question and then you know, focus more on the weakness side. If you're in your in the middle of your careers and you know the hiring manager says, you know what, we're really struggling. You know, we're, we're, we're not really struggling. What they'd probably say is, oh, you know, we're good, but you know, I find that uh, we're not very good in sourcing M&A loans, you know, cash flow loans, or we're not very good in finding investment property financing and development financing. Well, now they've given you the roadmap for kind of the wants for that hiring manager's wants. So you can position yourself to address those needs to say, hey, you know what? I'm willing enough to start targeting that market. That's exactly where I can help you. And with my background, you can look at my resume and what I'm doing. This is exactly perfect for me. And you, it helps you stand out and make you more desirable as a potential candidate because now you understand what the hiring manager's wish list is in terms of the gaps on the team and you position yourself to fill those gaps. And hopefully that helps you stand out and get that job. So this is another really good question. So overall, you know, when... Commercial banking applicants are looking to pick the right job. You know, these five questions are very important, you know, because the sales environment that you're in, the competitiveness of the product, the culture and the sales pressure that you're stepping into and the targets that you have to meet, those are all things that influence your day to day. But as well, asking these questions really just communicates your overall preparedness and professionalism and your ability and readiness to take on that task. So I think these are really important questions to ask and hopefully you can find the time at the end of an interview where you can you know, allocate 10, 15 minutes to say, hey, you know what, I got five questions for you. I'd love to ask you these questions and really go after it. Now, maybe in later stages of the interview or if you still have time at the, end, at the end of the interview, there's a few other questions I would probably ask as well and I've kind of put them here and just very quickly, you know, what are the common activities or actions that your top performers are doing today to find out what, what are those key steps? You know, are we given a marketing budget, you know, to host events, figuring out if the bank is going to support you and give you money to actually finance your outreach efforts versus you have to do it direct by just phone and traditional methods. Um, you know, this is, you know, communicating this third point communicates a lot about your willingness to prepare and your desire to get this job. Is there anything I should read or study before joining your team? 
And, you know, for me, I asked that question. I remember my hiring manager was like, you know what? You know, you're starting two months from now because I was just finishing up my other role here. I'll give you 20 credit applications, read them all, and get a sense of how we lend, how we write our credit apps and all that kind of stuff. So I was able to prepare on that. Um, you know, another one is, does your team deal with a lot of challenging clients or loan losses? You know, figure out their track record and figure out, you know, oh, what's going on? Like, why are there loan losses? You know, do you have a lot of underperforming clients? Because ultimately, those types of environments, in my opinion, they're difficult because now you're, you're starting to deal with a lot more kind of quarterly management and client management versus focus on new business development. And then lastly, I always ask this open-ended question in any interview, what am I asking that I'm not asking you? Or that should I should ask, and that really gives you a good sense of maybe one or two areas that uh, you know the manager missed in describing the opportunity. So that's pretty much it. Hopefully, you found the video helpful. If you do have any questions or would like to reach out, uh, you can contact me. You know, under the comments section, I'm pretty good in replying to your comments, or you can reach out at LinkedIn and hit me up there. And then, if you have any um, you know businesses or clients that are looking to sell. By the way, my day-to-day -day job is I'm actually an M&A banker in Canada, so I primarily focus on selling businesses in the $1 million to $100 million range. So if you have anything in that lower mid-market range, happy to kind of connect with you and talk about that opportunity as well. So other than that, good luck with your career search, good luck with your job interviews, and continue watching our videos. Thanks.